Hello and welcome to this next video in module 10. Here we're going to look at uh, another hypothesis test on two population means. This time we'll do a two-tailed test. Now, as you might expect, the difference between a one-tailed test and a two-tailed test with two populations is exactly the same as the difference between a one-tailed test and a two-tailed test with one population. So we'll see, uh, you'll, you'll see that work as we go through uh, the exercise, uh, but really I can almost say, you know, you've pretty well done this before because the differences are just so similar uh, to what we've already seen. So let's, uh, let's get into the exercise. I've got, I've got Justina with me again and I think she's anxious to go outside. Hey, Justina. Yeah, <laughs> she gets so tired of listening to me talk so much. Okay, we'll go for a walk soon. Okay, uh, one more problem. So let's get into it. Anybody who has had siblings knows how competitive they can become. Imagine two brothers play catch with a baseball. It may start as innocent play, but they won't be long before it becomes competitive and they start bragging about who can throw further than the other. So in order to settle the argument, dad comes out to take some measurements. After each brother throws the ball 50 times, Dad calculates kid A had an average distance of 44 feet. Let me just highlight some of these things as we go. So the sample sizes were 50. Kid A had an average distance of 44 feet. Kid B had an average of 46 feet. As one would expect, Kid B began bragging as soon as he hears the news, because after all, 46 is greater than 44, right? Dad suggests that on average, the two are throwing the ball the same distance. In other words, you're basically the same, 46 and 44 feet, there's no difference. Why? Well, because look at the variation in your throws. Kid A had a standard deviation of 7.3, Kid B had a standard deviation of 8.2. So there's a lot of variation in those distances. So Dad predicts that they're throwing the ball the same. So here, <laughs> poor dog, so here, Let's put the null and alternatives together. So I'll have uh, mu1 and mu2, mu1 and mu2. Let's call, uh, let's call kid A can be one, kid B can be two. In a two-tailed test, it's not that important. It doesn't really matter too much, um, but it's a formality, so we'd better do it anyways just to be consistent and just to be clear. Uh, formulate a test to test dad's claim. Okay, and dad says that they're throwing them the same distance, so that's a hypothesized value of zero. So you're either the difference is nothing or the difference is something, is basically what we're looking at here. Uh, okay, and uh, we don't have a level of significance, so let's uh, keep it simple, alpha 05. Uh, and again, because that hypothesized value is, uh, hypothesized difference is zero, we can just write it out like this, which I think becomes even easier to read, easier to interpret maybe. So there we go. Let's move on to uh, our justification. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, then that is right. These two kids, you're, there's so much variation in your throws, there's no difference. I can't, I can't support the claim that you're throwing it any different from each other. You're statistically in a tie. Uh, or if the evidence supports the alternative, well, yeah, there is a difference. Okay, I guess it's not a statistical tie. So the means are unequal if, uh, if we support the alternative. Let's get into our test statistic. So here again, this is a Z test x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the hypothesized value divided by our standard error, which is, uh, oh, I'll put general notation in here first, sigma a squared over n, I shouldn't use a, is sigma 1 over n1 plus sigma squared 2 over n2. Now we can just put in our values, so kid a was 44, Kid B was 46. Hypothesized difference is zero. And Kid A's standard deviation is 7.3. And they both threw it 50 times, so our sample sizes are the same. 8.2 squared over 50. Okay. And now again, I'm gonna calculate the denominator first. I find that's easier. You can do whatever 
whatever works best for you. Uh, 7.3 squared divided by 50 plus 8.2 squared divided by 50 square root 1.55 and my numerator well that's just negative 2 44 minus 46 good minus 2 so this is then going to be negative 2 divided by 155 and negative 129 okay there's our test statistic now we have uh, negative 129 now let's use our p-value approach so go to our tables look up negative negative 1.29 so we're way out here so I have a value of 0 0.0985. Good, and then we don't have to make any adjustments to it. That is the lower extreme uh, for for that that test statistic, negative 129. So I don't have to make any one minus uh, adjustments. But what we do have to do here is that because this is a two-tail test what we do have to do is multiply that by 2 in order to obtain our p-values. So again, let's get that calculator, 0 0.0985 times 2, and I have a value of point, in, what was it, oops, I went too fast, 19.7. So coming back to our problem, my p-value is 0 0.0. 197. So what do we say to these kids? There really is no difference in your ability to throw that baseball. Your average flight distances are statistically the same. With a p-value as large as that, remember our rejection rule. We reject if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. Alpha is 0.05. That p-value is definitely greater than alpha. So there is no way that we can comfortably reject. So the, uh, our evidence here then supports the null hypothesis. Verify with the critical value approach. So that critical value in this case, z alpha by 2, this is going to be equal to, we might have this one memorized by now, alpha is 0.05. So, oops. so alpha divided by 2 is 0.025. And so when we go to our tables, we look for 0 0.025. And so this is the 1.96 as our critical value. 1.96 plus or minus 1.96. Right? We will reject the null hypotheses if our test statistic is larger than positive 196 or smaller than negative 196. And our test statistic is negative 1.29, so it's somewhere right in here, which is in the middle, in between, and that is our do not reject space. Good. So everything works out. We've got a consistent conclusion and our p-value approach, critical value approach. Both of them support the null hypotheses that you two bratty kids, you're throwing the ball the same distance. Quit your complaining. Uh, okay, part F, confirm our findings with the confidence interval estimate. So remember in chapter uh, or module nine, when we were looking at the, the similarities between the confidence interval estimate and the conclusions of a hypothesis test, those comparisons can only be made uh, when we're looking at a two-tailed test and when we're looking at an, a c comparable level of significance. So here, our level of significance is alpha 05. So our level of confidence is 0.95. So what we can do for this one is we'll develop a 95% confidence interval and just see how that's comparable uh, to the results of this hypothesis test. So the formula that we need for that, x bar, it's really, it's always the same. It's that point estimate plus or minus the margin of error. The margin of error consists of the, the critical value and the standard error. 
So there shouldn't really be any surprises here. It's all the same ingredients uh, to these calculations. So let me uh, just draw out our picture. So our point estimate for these two, well it's two feet. I don't think I need my calculator for that one. There's, uh, there's negative two feet. And let's get our calculator out for the rest of this. So this is going to be minus two plus or minus that critical value, we already found it here, 1.96. This is the square root of 7.3 squared over 50 plus 8.2 squared over 50. So let's see, minus two plus or minus, let's get that margin of error calculated. 7.3 squared over 50 plus 8.2 squared over 50 square root times 1.96. So the margin of error is 3.04. Okay, now let's calculate our limits. So this is going to be negative 2 plus 3.04. So that's 1.4, uh, sorry, 1.04. And the lower limit is negative 2 minus 3.04 minus 5.04. Okay, so there's our 95% confidence interval. So what that means is I'm 95% confident that the average difference uh, in these two kids' ability to throw that ball is between minus 5 uh, feet and plus one feet. Uh, so what does that mean? How is that consistent with our test results? Well, remember it's the same rule as uh, we used for the single population mean. Uh, these confidence intervals, this is an estimate of the unknown population parameter. In this case, that unknown population parameter uh, is mu, uh, or the difference in mu. So it means that that difference mu1 minus mu2 is somewhere in here. Mu1 minus mu2. I don't know where, but I'm 95% confident that the difference is somewhere in there. As we can see, this is negative 2, this is positive 1. Somewhere in there lies the value of 0. So that right there is the consistency between the interval estimate and the hypothesis test. At the 95% level of confidence, zero is a possibility. And so that's why I'm unable to say that it's not zero, because at that level of confidence, zero exists within that interval, uh, which is our hypothesized difference. It exists within that interval. And because it exists within that interval, uh, that is our consistent result with a failure to reject the null hypothesis. At the 95% level of confidence, zero is a possibility, which is why I am unable to say that it is not zero. Okay, I hope that helps. It sounds a little bit tedious. Uh, maybe you can rewind and replay a few times if needed. The joys of these videos, although you're probably getting sick of my voice by now. <laughs> okay, uh, I guess it's time to go. I've got to get this dog out for a walk. She's given up. Hey, Justina, are you here? You want to go for a walk? Yeah, is it time to go? Okay, <laughs> she's feeling lazy. Okay, uh, thanks for watching. We'll uh, get back to this shortly. Bye-bye.